All right, we're here with Phil Tippin, my good buddy and a wonderful luthier for many, many moons. Um, not too many, but just, just the right amount. <laughs> More than you think. <laughs> um, tell people about how you got into, first got into woodworking. I think I was born with sawdust in my blood. Um, my mother always said I could fix anything. And so we would have, my father had a few tools that he stayed away from because he had tried to cut his finger off three times on a table saw, but fortunately that never happened to me. Yeah, and I was, yeah they're all here. <laughs> so uh, I just sort of grabbed some pieces of wood and started whittling and, and then I, my uncle was a really good craftsman. Um, he made model train cars and uh, the villages and the, where the trains would go around, that was his hobby and so I sort of helped him and it just got into my bloodstream. At one point you worked on wooden boats and did some repairs and things, right? Yeah, um, you know, I went to school and through my younger years I was always either part-time working for cabinets or helping with boat, boat building and um, I learned to do that quite well. And then when, when I went to school, University of Florida, um, I kind of worked my way through school and they had a, a job opening in their furniture department where they would do restorations of antique furniture and uh, repair work and so on. So four years of, of that, I became quite good at, in the furniture aspect of it through the beginnings of my boat career. Um, and my, my field of, my major was um, marine biology which I virtually never used <laughs> because the at that time the field was so wide open or was so closed up it was all volunteer work there were no paying jobs for the most part then today I kind of wish that I had that you know we're, we're able to work in the marine industry but um, well, you fish a lot I fish a lot <laughs> and I'm a captain a full-fledged captain captain and I run a boat out of Cape Cod uh, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is probably one of my favorite places ever that I lived. Cool. And your shop is actually in a, shares a, a building with a, a boat, um, they do repair or building? What they, what yeah, they do uh, storage repair, uh, some construction, mm -hmm. but it's an old building that was made in, in the um, early to mid 1800s and strictly for the ships. It was the uh, port for the old Ironsides, the Constitution, uh, right there in Massachusetts, and that was Marblehead. So there was a boat building company there, and, and the building is still there. And it's just uh, it's funky, but it's um, it's very cool. It's got a lot of character to it. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of being there a couple yeah. times. Yeah. Um, and tell me about how you got into guitar. Like, what, what, where was what was your first exposure to the instrument? I was actually in business for myself, uh, repairing boats, and I've always played guitar. Um, when I was a young kid, we used to go to my, my aunt's place, which was in northern Alabama, and originally I'm from the south, and she owned this big hotel, and it was sort of a buffet-type dinner, and she had, you know, the servants and things, so, so we'd, we'd all eat dinner, and then we'd go into the to the, uh, the library or the music room, and there was a piano and a Victrola and all kinds of instruments to play, and we'd sit around after dinner and sing for hours, mm -hmm. and that's where I learned to play uh, ukulele was my first instrument. Uh -huh. and, but um, getting back to how I got into guitar making was that um, I wanted a new guitar, and the one that I wanted, um, I couldn't afford at the time. And a friend of mine who owned a music store said to me, why don't you buy a kit from Martin Guitars? And so that's what I did, and I built my first kit, and that was the last kit that I made. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a lot of figuring out on my own. And back then it was the, uh, early late 70s early 80s when i first started building and there were there were no schools um there were no specific tools like there are today uh, the woods were if you knew someone you could get wood um, today is a whole different story it's gone from 
you can get anything you want, the best of the best, and import it into a very strict form of selling and buying um, with the exotic woods. And it's, it's gone through a, a heyday to a, a tough day, basically, uh, in the guitar making. But it's work that is always stimulating. It's always intriguing. It's always challenging. You're always either fixing something that you screwed up and to be a good luthier you have to be able to do that mm -hmm. and if you don't then you're gonna it's disastrous because we all screw up yeah, yeah. and you're one of the builders that um, also enjoys repair work and you do a lot for dream guitars I do and I always have and, and, um, I, and I never advertised it it just sort of built on its own mm -hmm. and I think I was repairing my own guitar before I started doing anything else and and like my mother said, I could fix anything, so I just sort of kept doing that. <laughs> and then and how does that inform your building? How does repair and having seen inside the guitars? A, a great deal, because I get to see a lot of the problems or warranty work that other builders have, including the big builders like Martin and Gibson and the old timers, and, and see what, what they did not knowing what was going to happen. So when I started building guitars, I already had that knowledge of what was going to happen, so I tried to do something to, to prevent it. So my warranty work is nothing. Right. I, I have zero warranty work for the most part. And you know, and I'm proud of that, that's, sure. that's great. But I think it was that education through repair that um, I was able to achieve that. Cool, and one final question for you. What, um what one thing or what one event during your building career most affected your tone or your ability to find your tone? Was there one? Uh, I don't think it was any one particular event or one particular idea. I think it was uh, a continuous evolving of trying to achieve a tone that I thought was better than the last. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it was the best that I was the best builder, but it was just something, it was a goal of my own to achieve, well, I think this is a little tight, or I think this is a little bit too bassy, and I'm not hearing the mid-ranges, and what can I do with that? And again, it was not something you call and say, hey Al, can you tell me how to do this? It was something that you just sort of figure out. And seeing so many other guitars, I was able to hear what their tones were and whether I liked them or not or whether it was something that I wanted to do. And it's, um, it's very difficult to try to copy a tone from another guitar maker, which I think is, has made this industry so friendly. But um, I, I just evolved through th the traditional bracing, which was the DX with tone bars and Martin Gibson and all of those early people did kept some of it added to and finally came up with a formula that that I liked and it seemed to work for a lot of people. Great guitars like the Alpedoe model in your hand. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, thank you Bill, I really appreciate you chatting with us. Uh, my pleasure and you have contributed to the the aid and the assistance of all of us I think and uh, I, my gratitude goes out to you for having a lot to do with helping me uh, in the sales industry of it and exposing, help exposing my craft to, to the world, basically. So, thank my, you. many thanks. Our great pleasure.